Hello, hello, good evening. Welcome, welcome. Thank you for joining me. I pray that you had a wonderful, fabulous Friday and that you had got a lot done, got a lot of productivity and positivity going on in your life today. So let me get started with prayer. Heavenly Father, I thank you. Thank you for this Friday, this fabulous Friday, another day that you have made for us to enjoy and to live through. We pray, O oh God, that as we continue to live for you and to stand for you, that your power would be brought to bear in our lives. We pray, O oh God, that as we look into this session, your word would be exalted and you would be glorified in Jesus' name. Amen, amen, and amen. God bless you, bless you. Our topic this evening is prayer, our most powerful weapon. Prayer, our most powerful weapon. Whenever we hear of a weapon or you know, some bomb or something of that magnitude or that nature. Um, humanity begins to panic because we know that weapons and bombs and explosive devices, they can cause, they can wreak havoc. They have the ability to destroy, with through an explosion, they have the ability to destroy hundreds of people all at the same time, thousands sometimes, all at the same time. When it comes to wars, they they've killed millions with bombs and heavy artillery and all that kind of stuff people's lives get lost when we talk about weapons and bombs and all that kind of stuff but sometimes we don't think of prayer as a weapon as christians we don't think of prayer as a weapon but prayer is really our most powerful weapon the most powerful weapon that we can use is prayer when we pray things happen but the average christian to them prayer hardly Prayer is hardly considered as a weapon. In any real sense of the word, prayer is not considered a weapon, much less one that can bring results. It's not considered that way. Um, we, we think of prayer as a chore. We think of prayer as something that we have to struggle to do, to push ourselves to do or press ourselves to do. But if we look at prayer as um, an army person would look at their weapons, look at it and say oh I need my gun oh I need to put to make sure this grenade in my pocket if we think of prayer as that when we're fighting against the kingdom of darkness we would be more serious about prayer and we would do it more often we won't think of it as a chore because Jehovah repeatedly ensures us that we get results when we pray the Word of God is filled with instances where people got results when they prayed so we need to think of prayer through it. We need to see prayer through a different set of lenses. If we are going to be forceful, if we are going to be effective in our prayer lives, we need to think of prayer as a weapon. We need to think of it as a weapon. And we don't do it frequently because we don't believe in its power. We don't believe that it can change things. So, and we, we are so connected to this touch field world where our five senses are in control and we know what we get because our five senses say so. We don't understand what happens when we pray. We feel like nothing is happening. So because nothing happens immediately and we feel like nothing's happening, we don't pray very much. We don't pray very much. And it causes us to doubt. Anything, we doubt that anything is really happening when we pray. We resist prayer. We only pray when we have disasters or catastrophe. That's the only time we pray. You have to pray now because you got a disaster on your hand. Now you have to pray. But on an average, mm, might pray, might not. Days, weeks, months go by. You don't have to pray because everything going well. And that's one of the trick of the enemy too. He's not going to pressure you if he believes that when he pressures you, it's going to push you into prayer. If he believed that his pressure and his bothering you and, and, and attacking you is going to push you into prayer, he's not going to attack you. He's going to leave you right alone, let you sleep, let you can continue to enjoy life and stay away from the presence of God. Because that's what prayer does. Prayer brings us into the presence of God. And this cycle goes on and on and on. We don't like to pray because we don't see anything happening. We don't pray so nothing happens. And the cycle just keeps rolling along. And the enemy is having fun because of our ignorance. The enemy can operate freely without any resistance from, from the people of God. We're not, we're not putting up any fight against him. Why? We're enjoying life. And he's not bothering us. I say, I've heard it said, persons say, I don't bother the devil and he don't bother me. He's gradually and slowly bothering you like, you know, cooking that frog slowly. He's stealing little things from you that you don't even see. 
causing you little um, problems and issues and stuff that you think are a part of life. So you don't push back and you don't get upset. Oh, that's just life. All the while it's the enemy taking advantage of you because you do not have the connection with God intact. Your connection with God intact. So the kingdom of darkness is quite satisfied with prayerless Christians. Really happy with them. They're really happy with them. Because what prayer does, prayer pushes back on the evil. Pushes back on evil and it pushes back on darkness. Prayer gives the kingdom of God and his host of angels, it gives them an access point through which they can operate in the earth realm. How did, how did when we pray and God starts sending assistance, an angelic assistant, how did the angel get here? We prayed for them. We prayed for that assistance from God and God sent the assistance through his angels. So how did we get the assistance? Through the angels of God. Why did we get it? Because we prayed for it. And if we don't pray, they don't come. If we don't pray, they don't come. They move around the earth, keeping peace and whatever they could do based on what who's praying and who's giving them access. See, because the spirit realm needs access from physical beings. We are physical beings. We can move around and function in this earth realm. I uh, Several videos back, we talked about how spirits are like the wind. They need to influence humans, oppress, possess humans in order to get their work done because we have the physical bodies to get things done in the earth realm. Contrary to popular belief, we believe that Jehovah can just come, crash down in the earth and do whatever he feel like and change the heart of man and strong arm everybody and make them serve him. He cannot do that and he will not do that because he gave authority to Adam and Adam turned it over to Satan. So now we are in a situation where if we don't tell Jehovah, Jehovah, come into my heart, come into my life, come into my nation, come into my home, come in, welcome, welcome Holy Spirit. We don't do those kind of things. Then they have no access. And the enemy continues his rampage because the average person is well engaged and well employed in the kingdom of darkness. They carry out the, the practices and habits of the kingdom of darkness every day. It's us as Christians that are not doing what we're supposed to be doing in the earth realm. 2 Corinthians 4 verse 3 to 4 declares, But if our gospel is hid, if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost, in whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. This scripture is telling us that the enemy, the God of this world, works to blind the minds of mankind. Keep them blind. Keep them looking at what they could touch, see, feel, hear. Keep them right there and let them continue there. Don't let them come into contact with a spiritual relationship with Jesus Christ. He wants them to remain in the darkness. That's not hard for him to do though. Since we were born with the tendency and the uh, feeling to sin the desire to sin, the desire for silver, sinful things, we were born with that within us because of Adam's neglect, because of Adam's rebellion, because Adam went against the word of God, then that caused us to be born in sin. The Bible says we were born in sin, shaped in iniquity. So it's not hard for the enemy to do. It's like gravity. Gravity keeps us grounded on the earth. It keeps the gravitational pull of the earth, keeps us on the earth. If we want to leave the earth, it is natural for gravity to hold us to the earth. If we want to leave the terror, the earth, if we want to leave the earth, we need power. If we want to go into the air or go into space, we need an engine or some power to fight back against that pull of gravity that's pulling us down to the earth. And that's what Jesus does. That's what happens when we decide to give Jehovah access to our lives. He gives us that power. He gives us this power. The power that we need to move our lives into um, the spirit realm and into a place of victory, into a place of power and authority. That's what the power and the spirit of God does for us. That's the only thing that moves us from our carnal nature into a higher nature, into a a blessed nature move us out of the curse into the blessing that's how we move be through the power of God other than that 
The thought of this world is blinding our minds. It's like a jet. If we want to get off the ground, we need a jet, a rocket, something with power to move us off of the surface of the earth. Because of the gravitational pull, that's the only way we're getting off of the surface of the earth. It takes that propulsion power, propulsion engine, we need that. And that's the power of the Holy Ghost. It moves us out of the flesh. All these fleshly desires, it severs sever that and separates us from that so that we can walk in the righteousness of Christ. We can resist the enemy and live for Jesus Christ. Because the world, the flesh, and the devil, they're working together in harmony to make sure we stay in the darkness. And they're working to make, maintain control of this world system and everyone in it. That's what their work is. That's their main goal. Get control and blind the minds of the people and keep them that way. On the other hand, Jehovah, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit are working together in harmony as well. But they are seeking to draw mankind into the kingdom of heaven. And the more we pray, the more access they have, the more access he has in the earth. Even though people may be lost, if we as Christians pray for them, it makes an influence on their lives and causes them to at least get a glimmer of the light of God here and there. And the more we pray and the more they surrender, they come around and they come into the kingdom of God as well. And that's how it happens. But it happens through prayer. We are physical beings in this physical world. We can spirits cannot take authority over us unless we yield. We still have authority. We still have the authority to choose, to choose who will control our lives. Who will control us? The enemy or Jehovah? We get to choose. We have the power of choice. We get to choose both good, the forces of good, or the forces of evil in the spirit realm. Who are we going to surrender to? Because both of them are vying for our attention. They're vying for our allegiance. Jehovah is vying for our allegiance. He's telling us, come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. And the enemy here says what? It's a good time in here. Let's party like rock stars, and we're going to have some fun. And we can enjoy all the pleasures of this world and the pleasures of the flesh. We can enjoy those. So the pull is from the left and the right and up and down, just pulling at us all the time. But we get to choose who we surrender to. They can only influence, influence us. They can only influence us. They cannot make us do anything. We are the ones that surrender. They need us. They need human beings with bodies in this world. The Holy Spirit of God influences us through songs, sermons, witnessing, books. When people stop on the side of the road and give you a track, that's the Spirit of God moving towards us and cause drawing us to himself, trying to get an access into our lives, trying to change us into his image so that he can have another vessel in the earth to carry out his plan. And that's what he does. The Holy Spirit influences us. And he draws us to Jehovah. And Jehovah now has access in the world through us. And that's why the Apostle Paul admonished the Romans in Romans 12, 1. He said, I beseech ye therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Present your body. A living sacrifice. Lord, we say, Jesus, use me. Jesus, use me. Yes, we say, Jesus, use me. But do we really want Jesus to use us? But when we say, Jesus, use me, and we follow that up with our actions, we are now vessels in the earth that Jehovah can use. And we must be reminded that everything for that, that I'm talking about working for Je it, Jehovah, it also works in the kingdom of darkness. But because our flesh is already prone to sin, this process, we, it's like we're sitting on a, if we sit down and just let it happen, let sin happen to us or let life take its course, it's like sitting on a lazy river. Whichever way that river is going, if you're not doing anything, the lazy river will take you in the direction that it's going. We don't need to do anything at all to go in the wrong direction. It's happening all around us. It's picking us, us up and pressing against us, in fact, causing us and trying to pull us in that direction. So we don't have to do anything in order to sin. We don't have to, if we don't put up any resistance, we're going to automatically sin. 
our flesh will automatically move in the direction that sin is going, that the enemy is going, that the world is going. Our bodies, our spirits, our minds will automatically go in that direction. We have to fight. We have to resist in order to have our lives go in the direction of Jesus Christ. You're going to have to fight for that. That ain't going to happen naturally. You're going to have to pray. Remember the weapon? Prayer is going to have to be our weapon in order for Jehovah to use us. It's a constant battle for souls, the souls of men. And this is where prayer comes in. You see, the more we pray, the more we resist darkness. The more we pray, the more we pray, we push back on the forces of darkness. We restrict the evil forces. Prayer builds a resistance to the enemy. Builds a resistance against the world, against his advances. And be warned, the enemy is constantly working to advance his kingdom. Not only in the world, but also in our lives. He's constantly working to get his agenda to happen and to move forward in our lives. If we just sit around thinking that Jehovah will, will, you know, will make us do anything, will arbitrarily help us. I'm just going to sit right here. God's going to help me. Really, you need to get in prayer, communication, connection. In order. You need to connect with him in order for that to take place. It's like putting a, a plug into a wall. You could put your computer up or whatever device you have up. But if you don't plug that into the wall, you ain't getting no power. You have to plug in. Plug into Jehovah and let him, let his power flow through you. That you can be of a resistance to the power of evil in the earth. That's just, that's how sinners engage in the kingdom of darkness. And we see it every day. We see it happening all around us all day long. And we don't realize those people are diligently working for the kingdom of, in the kingdom of darkness. They feel like, oh, I'm just doing my own thing. You are employed by the enemy. You are employed by the destroyer of your soul. You are employed by him and working for him every day. And you feel like you're doing your own thing. Is your own thing good or bad? Is it good or bad? If it's bad, it's, in, it's orchestrated by the enemy. It's coming from your flesh. So the kingdom of darkness is being promoted every day. And that's how we must engage in the kingdom of Jehovah. We must make sure that we are working in his kingdom every day. Do I mean drop your job and go on the side of the street and go to the ends of the earth? No. There are so many things you can do to promote the kingdom of God. And that's why I'm talking about prayer. Prayer is one of the easiest, simplest, but the most powerful way that we can influence the world for the kingdom of God. Prayer. We can do it anywhere. We can do it as much as we want. We can be as sincere as we want. But prayer is our power source. Prayer is our powerful weapon. Our most powerful weapon is prayer. We must pray and study that word every day. The kingdom of darkness knows the Christians that pray. And they know the ones that are reading and studying the word of God. They are a threat to the kingdom of darkness. So the kingdom of darkness know them. They know us. They know the ones that are praying. They know the ones that are fasting. They know the ones that are reading the word of God. They know. They are aware. They can't do you nothing. Because you are, you are marked for Jehovah and protected by Jehovah. But they know you. They know. Why? Because... Sometimes we feel like, oh, when we go to church and we pray, and oh, that person can pray. It's one thing to pray in public, but what's going on in your private life? What's going on when you're all alone, when you're by yourself? What are you doing? Are you watching hours and hours of television and no Bible time, no study time, no prayer time? See, the enemy knows who's praying. The enemy knows who's watching TV. The enemy knows who's on the internet for hours and hours and hours. He knows. So he knows who has the power because he knows if you spend, if you spend an hour, two hours, three hours in prayer, oh, that's a problem for him. That's a problem for him, especially if you are living right and clean hands and pure heart and you spend in two, three hours in prayer, oh, he's going to have a problem. Why? Because you're going to come against the forces of evil in the world and the angels are going to be busy doing what you're saying and asking the Father to get done in the earth. You're gonna, he's going to have a problem with you. 1 Peter 5, 8 declares, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about, seeking whom he may devour. Okay. The kingdom of darkness knows the Christians who are sober. 
they know the Christians who are vigilant. Why? Because they have labeled these persons as a threat to their kingdom. You are a threat to the kingdom of darkness if you are a person that prays. If you are a person that studies your Bible regularly, you are a threat to the kingdom of darkness. Because any minute you could decide to witness to somebody and the Spirit of God will touch them and draw them. Remember it earlier talked about coming into the light? Into his marvelous light? Yes. Draw them into the kingdom of light. So you're a threat to the kingdom of darkness. So what will they do? They will try to tr be constantly trying to trip you up, attack you, lure you into sin with all kind of little, you know, things that, you know, your flesh like, trying to get you to surrender to that and give in to that so that you can block and cut off that connection you have with God. Cut off that hot relationship you have with God because that's what sin does. Sin throws water on your fire. The fire you have in God and the fire you have in prayer and the fire you have to get things done in the earth through the Spirit of God and through the angels of God, that fire gets water on it when you sin. So the enemy is constantly trying to get you to trip you up. They know that sin will cut off your connection to Jehovah, so they are constantly trying to get the Christians who pray, get them to sin. But if the Christians remain faithful and continue to pray, then they cannot be devoured. See, say, seeking whom he may devour, he cannot devour them. Why? They are in connection with Jehovah. They are connected to Jehovah. And they are not indulging in his sinful acts that he's tempting. They're not. They're resisting. The Bible says, resist the devil and he will flee from you. They are resisting the enemy. Keep resisting me. Yes, keep resisting him. Let him stay right out there. No. No. And they will cause, and when you continue to pray like that, you cause constant angelic assistance to be going on in the earth realm. And when those angels come, they don't come to play. They come in response to your prayers. They come in the, to the earth to do certain things. When you pray for your nation and you plead the blood of Jesus over the nation and you pray for the islands and you pray for the community and you pray for your community, you pray for your house, your children, your spouse, you pray for them. And the Spirit of the Lord deals and, and comes in and, and overshadows them and the power of the angelic host keeps them safe, keeps a border and a boundary around them so that they're protected from the works of the enemy. They come in response to our prayers. Prayer is our most powerful weapon. We continually strive to please Jehovah and we continue to pray and study and read the word. We will be powerful and we will be a problem for the enemy. When we go into prayer with clean hands and pure hearts, the angels are assigned to us. And they go into action to facilitate and bring about the answer to our prayers. They go into action because they respond to the word of God. And while the answer may not come instantly, in fact, it might, not, it might take quite a while for your answer to come. But you must not stop. Be constant in prayer. Continue to pray. Continue to pray and thank the Lord for the answers that you are expecting to come from the kingdom of God. Because prayer is our most valuable, most powerful weapon. Psalms 103 verse 20 said, Bless the Lord, ye his angels, that excel in strength, that do his commandments, hearkening unto the voice of his word. When we give the word of God a voice, when we start declaring the word, the word of God, the eyes of the Lord are upon the righteous and his ears are open to their cry. When we start, when we start declaring the word of God like that, when we start declaring like David said, I've never seen the righteous forsaken, nor a seed begging bread. When we start declaring the word of God like that, the angels jump on that word because that's what they are commanded by. They're not commanded by our crying and our weeping and our poor me. They don't respond to that. Find some word. Find some of the word of God that applies to what you're praying for and pray. Pray continue to pray. Joseph prayed every day of his life, probably multiple times per day. However, a period of 13 years passed between the time that his brother sold him into slavery and when he became prime minister. 13 years. He was praying and standing up and living holy for 13 years in slavery. 
I'm sure there were days when he was crying, when he was praying and crying and sorrowful. And I'm quite sure he had a couple of temper tantrums, but he was like, Lord, what is going on? I'm serving you in spirit and in truth. And look what's happening. Quite sure he had a couple of days like that too. But every day, several times a day, Joseph prayed. He prayed. Imagine the warfare. Imagine the warfare in the spirit realm over Joseph because he was such a praying man. Joseph was in a pagan culture. Those people knew nothing about Jehovah God. They bowed down to their idols that they built and stood them up and they bowed down to them and do all their rituals and everything. The kingdom of darkness could not afford to have a servant of Jehovah sitting in such a high place. You think they easily gave that up and just said, oh, okay, he's going to be prime minister. Oh, no. There was a lot of angelic protection and, pro and angelic interaction going on in the life of David, in the life of Joseph. All around him, there were probably angels that had to guard him and protect him because the enemy wanted to kill him because he know, they knew that God had a special plan for his life. Now, initially, when his brothers sold them, I guess they had the idea, oh, he's never going to be anything because he's now a slave. But as they watch him continue to elevate, they watch Jehovah continue to elevate him. He was sold on the auction block. He was sold to Potiphar. Potiphar put him in charge of his whole house. And then he had to come in and do something to break this trend because Joseph is making, he's moving too fast. We got to break this down. So along come Potiphar's wife to try and tempt him, throw him in prison. He goes to prison. He's in charge of the prison. He starts growing and he starts moving again. But when this time, when it was time for him to move, he moved straight to the to the palace. He moved to the palace. He was in the middle of the enemy's camp. So here's Joseph offering a praise and thanksgiving to Jehovah every day. And where was he? In the middle of Potiphar's life. In the middle of Egypt. In Egypt, lifting up Jehovah, praying to him every day. He was in the prison, praising and praying and praising God. And ultimately, he went to the palace. Imagine the angels coming to deliver the answer to Joseph's prayers. You think they just walk in and say, Oh, we come, Joseph, going up to the palace today. Oh, no. A big fight every day over that. In the spirit realm, just constant battling. Why? Because to get the power of God into the earth, somebody has to pray. Joseph was praying. So the angelic activity around him was a whole lot. A whole lot. There are certain things that the enemy could not do to him because he was a praying man. He prayed and he kept himself pure before the Lord. This kind of power comes with passionate, consistent prayer. Nothing in this world can stop our communication with Jehovah. If we really want to communicate with him, nobody can stop us. Nothing can stop us. We can sit quietly and just commune with him. You don't have to tear up the place and break up the place. And everybody know you praying and you tear up. You don't have to go through all of that for Jehovah to hear you. No. He just needs your heart to be right. And he can hear a whisper. He can hear your meditation. Even though a word is not coming out of your mouth. When our prayers are coming from a pure heart, when we bow in prayer, we can pray like Jesus did at the tomb of Lazarus. Jesus got a message from Lazarus' sister that he was sick. In John 11, 41, in John 11, chapter 4, sorry, when Jesus, it says, when Jesus heard that, he said, this sickness is not unto death, but for the glory of God, that the Son of God might be glorified thereby. So Jesus is saying, Lazarus may be sick, but his sickness is not, death is not going to be the end of this sickness. The end of this sickness, Jehovah and myself are going to be glorified in this matter. And in verse 41, it says, then they took away the stone. This is when Jesus arrived at the tomb of Lazarus. Then they took away the stone from the place where the dead was laid. And Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank thee that thou hast heard me. And I knew that thou hearest me always. But because of the people which stand by, I said it, that they may believe that thou hast sent me. And when he had thus spoken, when he thus had spoken, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. Lazarus, come forth. Jesus was confident in prayer. 
He was not guessing. He was not wondering. Here he was about to call a man out of the tomb who was dead for four days. It ain't like he just, this breath just gone and Jesus show up and call him back because, you know, just wake him up because he probably dropped into a coma or something. And he, the man was dead for four days. He was in the grave, sealed in a tomb. He, Jesus didn't have to jump around. He didn't have to scream. He didn't have to shout. He didn't have to buy nothing, rebuke nothing, nothing. He didn't have to do any of that. He simply commanded Lazarus to come forth. Now, do you think the powers of darkness wanted this amazing miracle to take place? You believe now the enemy wanted all this glory to go to God of raising Lazarus from the tomb? Never. Mm -mm. We can't have that. We got to do something to fight that. That can't happen. Remember, Jesus said that Lazarus' sickness was for the express purpose of bringing glory to the Father and to his son, Jesus Christ, to him and to his father. That was the purpose of Lazarus' sickness and his death. And notice that Jesus thanked the father for hearing him before he even called Lazarus out of the tomb. He thanked the father. What did Jesus do? Jesus prayed. Jesus prayed. Father, I thank you that you always hear me. Jesus prayed. Jesus is the Son of God, the Messiah. So why did he need to pray before he performed this miracle? Why did he need to pray? Why he couldn't just walk up to the tomb and say, Lazarus, come out here. No, he prayed. Lazarus was coming from the place of the dead. The place, how much people come back from the dead? Not very many. Lazarus was coming back from the place of the dead. So Jesus is now connect, connecting with his father and saying, Father, for the glory of your kingdom, for the glory of your son, for the glory of your name, send Lazarus back. Send Lazarus' spirit back from the land of the dead. You think death, the person, the demon in charge of death, who holding on to all the dead, dead people, death. Remember it says, oh grave, where's thy victory? Well, death, where's thy sting here? Well, you think death wants Lazarus to come back and all this glory to go to God? He was not planning on releasing Lazarus. He didn't have to release nobody else. Why I have to release Lazarus? He had to release Lazarus because Jehovah said so. Jehovah said, release Lazarus' spirit. Why did, why did Jehovah say release Lazarus' spirit? Because Jesus prayed and told his father, for the glory of your name, let Lazarus... In essence, this is what Jesus was praying. I know you heard me. I know you always hear me when I pray. You want to do this in the earth to show that I have power over death. And so Jesus called Lazarus' spirit back from the land of the dead. Call him back. Do you think that the dead, the dead, the land of the dead wanted to surrender? No, they did not want to surrender him. So we all know there was some animosity and some problems going on in the spirit realm. But what they had to do, they had to stand aside and watch Lazarus' spirit go back to his body. Why? Because Jehovah said so. And how did this all get started? Jesus prayed. And Jehovah commanded that Lazarus be released from the land of the dead. Imagine the demons in the place of the dead sucking their teeth and trying to figure out, where he go in? Nobody else don't get out of here. How is this going to happen? Why is this happening? Because Jehovah said so. Release the spirit of Lazarus back to his body. So they had to back aside and watch Lazarus leave. Watch the spirit of Lazarus go back to his body. And that is real power. That is real. When you could call somebody from the dead, that is real power. And what was the power? Jesus prayed. In Matthew 26, 53, it says, um, we're talking about Jesus. Jesus had to describe the power of this weapon of prayer. This is how he described it. He said, this is when he was in Gethsemane. And um, his, Peter, one of his disciples, Peter chop off the, the soldiers there. Air. They come to take Jesus and Peter say, not on my watch. And he swing the sword and cut off the dude there, cut his hair right off. And Jesus put it back. Jesus restored it. And Jesus is saying now, this is Matthew 26, 53. Jesus is saying, thinkest thou that I cannot now Pray to my Father, 
and he shall presently give me more than twelve legions of angels. Twelve legions of angels. A legion, I think, I think they said it's a thousand angels. So that's twelve thousand angels Jesus could have just by calling it, just by saying it. Father, I'm done with this episode. I don't want to go through this no more. Send me some angels to deal with this matter and I'm coming back home. He said, beat me up, Scotty. I'm coming back home. So Jesus is telling him, I could do that if I want to do that. I can pray. He said, thinkest thou that I cannot now pray to my father and he shall presently give me more than 12 legions of angels. Prayer. Our most powerful weapon, prayer. Jesus demonstrated that this aspect of prayer, there's an aspect of prayer that we Christians must come to understand. We must come to understand it. We must understand that we can pray and cause war to break out in the heavenly realm. We can cause war to break out, especially if we're praying about a matter um, in which demonic forces feel like that's their territory and they control that and everything. I control this. Because sometimes you'll see people, like people on the side of the street or derelicts or, or alcoholics or stuff like that, and they are bound and tied. So when a Christian goes up to them and starts to witness to them and pray for them and bind alcohol and, and cast out spirits and stuff like that, when they start doing that, fight breaks out. War breaks out in the spirit realm. Why? The spirits feel like they own this person. This person belongs to me. I've been, he's been an alcoholic for 20 years. Ain't nobody delivering him. Just how they didn't want our, um, Lazarus out of the tomb. They couldn't stop it. When Jehovah is ready to deliver, all he needs is an agent to go and make that connection in prayer over the lives of people. And they can be delivered. And sometimes the demonic forces feel like they own their control of the situation. Ain't nobody coming in here to try to change things. We've been in this person for years. We've been in this household for years. We've been controlling this family for years. Ain't nobody changing this. But when you pray, when you pray, when the intercessors pray over their community, over their island, over their nation, when they begin to decree and declare the word of God over them, over the area, big fight break out. Why? Because while the demonic force was there, resting, cool, calm, collected, we control this joint, all of a sudden now the intercessors start to pray, and the angelic hosts come in response to those prayers. So what's going to happen? When the angels show up, that's big fight. This is our territory. This is our nation. We've been running this nation for years. What y'all do? No. Big fight break out in the in the realm of the spirit, in the spirit realm, in the heavenly, the angel. Because when the saints pray, portals are opened so that the angels now have access. It's like I come to, like when you come, you go to a strange place and nobody knows you. And they're like, who you come to? They'd be like, oh, I come to George. Who George? George Wilson. George, you know this guy? Yes, I know him. Let him through. So, when we pray, we tell the angelic host, come on. We tell the Spirit of God, welcome, come in. Take control of the situation for us. And because we have, remember I talk about the physical body, we have the option. We have the choice to say, I want the kingdom of God to come to my community. I'm the person with the right to be here. I have a physical body. I'm surrendering, surrendering myself to Jehovah. And I want the kingdom of God to come to my community. So because you want that and you declare that, the angels are now instructed to go forth. Because a person, a real flesh and blood person has now declared and decreed. A person who has a communication and a connection to Jehovah has declared and, declared and decreed, Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done in this community, in this house, in my children, in my husband, in my life, in my school, in my church. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. And you declare that and you decree that and things start moving and shaking in the, in the spirit realm. It's that big war break out, big fight break out. Because they always feel like they are the bullies. They are bullies. They really believe they own everything. But when we pray, 
That's our power, our most powerful weapon. When the angels show up, they don't come to play. They come to bring to pass the word of God that you have spoken in prayer. Their sole purpose in the earth is to ensure that the word of God that's being declared and decreed, they come to make sure that that is being fulfilled. So the more those intercessors pray, the more they fast, the more they keep on that, that line and keep firing and firing and firing those prayers and firing the word of God, the more intense the battle becomes the more the angelic hosts have access to the earth realm. And that's why we cannot allow what we see to influence the word of God, what the word of God says. We know what the word of God says. Stick to that. Don't mind what you see. Continue to pray. For example, the word of God says that by his stripes, you are healed. So when you start to pray for healing, sometimes the pain will get worse the pain will get worse sometimes the symptoms get worse but keep praying ignore what you see ignore what you feel continue to pray lord your word declares by your stripes i am healed by the blood of jesus i am set free you continue to declare that every day every time you think about every time you feel the pain you continue to declare that and Jehovah will guide you and direct you as to how to handle that, that, that problem in your body. Whether it's doctor, whether it's just by, if it doesn't happen immediately, just continue to ask Jehovah, pray, and Jehovah will direct you as to how to deal with that health issue. But pray, continue to pray, continue to pray. The book of Daniel gives us a demonstration of this in chapter 10. Daniel chapter 10. Verses 10 to 13 says, And behold, a hand touched me, this is Daniel, which set me upon my knees and upon the palms of my hands. And he said unto me, O Daniel, a man greatly beloved, understand the words that I speak unto thee, and stand upright, for unto thee am I now sent. And when he had spoken this word unto me, I stood trembling. And then said he unto me, Fear not, Daniel, for from the first day that thou didst set thine hand, that thine heart to understand and to chasten thyself before the, thy God, thy words were heard, and I am come for thy words. But the prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me one and twenty days. But lo, Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me. And I remain there with the kings of Persia. So, here is Daniel going into prayer. He prayed one day, two days, three days, ten days, fifteen days, twenty, twenty days, twenty-one days. And then the angel shows up with the answer. Daniel could have stopped praying after day three, after day five. Oh, this ain't working out. Oh, it ain't happening. I don't see anything happening. So, it make no sense for me to continue with this. But Daniel did not stop praying. He continued to pray. Daniel continued to pray. And what he said? From the first day that thou settest thine heart to understand. From the first day Daniel made up in his mind, I am going to fast until the answer comes. I am going to pray until the answer comes. And that has to be our resolution. I'm going to pray until the answer comes. Not giving up, not stopping, not giving in. Because the battle is taking place in the spirit realm where the angels are trying to deliver your package, deliver what you're asking Jehovah for, but there's battle, there's battles going on in the spirit realm. The angel is telling Daniel that the prayer, his prayer was heard on the first day. But notice how Daniel did not stop praying. After day one, he didn't stop. Day two, day 10, day 15, day 20, day 21, he did not stop. He did not give up. He knew God would answer him. If he continued to call, if he continued to pray, if he continued to fast. You see, Daniel was praying for the restoration of the people of Israel. He was praying for the restoration of the nation of Israel. And that was something that Jehovah wanted. Jehovah wanted the nation restored. 
Daniel wanted the nation restored. But how it gonna happen? It ain't gonna happen by osmosis. Somebody in the earth has to pray. And Daniel put himself in a position where he was going to be the person. If he had to stand alone and pray, he was going to pray until the answer came. And that is something that Jehovah wanted. Jehovah cannot come just randomly, just show up and take over. Somebody in the earth has to pray. Someone has to stand against the forces, stand in the gap and stand against the forces of evil to pray that matter through, to pray that miracle through. To activate the angelic forces, someone has to pray. The angels must come to fight against the demonic forces that is keeping this problem in place. The angels have to come to break up that camp. Break that up. Come, uh-uh. Time up for this. We're done with this. And they, because they did bullies, they feel like they control everything. feel like they're supposed to take over and hold down and bind up everything. But when the angelic hosts show up, somebody in the earth praying and we're here to deliver the answer to that prayer and so the fight begins the fight begins it never fails it works every time especially if we know the rules of how to use this weapon of warfare this weapon of our warfare if we know how to use this powerful weapon of prayer we would be able to get victory every single time every single time it's like you can think of this, a soldier. If a soldier is issued, say, a super, a super bazooka, you know the bazooka that they shoot the things from, or a rocket launcher. If the army issues him this powerful weapon, and all he does with it is play with the laser light, press the button so the laser light could go around and laugh and play with them. That's a very powerful weapon. And that's what we do. Prayer is a very powerful weapon. Now, what do we do? We play games. We play games. And just how just how the soldier playing with the laser light, that that weapon is so powerful. It could do so much destruction to the enemy. But the enemy come and slap you in your head and tell you, try put that down because you only use it. Put that bazooka down, you only use it. You there are praying these little now I lay me down to sleep and all this kind of stuff like this and these little prayers that you don't you you they're not effective because you're not really engaged in it. You're just doing a ritual, carrying out a habit, carrying out something that you know, oh, I just didn't do this because that's what you used to. When you go to church, you pray, so I'm going to pray. Flashing the little light, flashing the little laser light on the bazooka of prayer. No, don't do that. Learn how to use that weapon. Learn how to use that weapon. You have that weapon and the enemy come in and bomb in your life tearing up things in your life and all you're saying is now i lay me down to sleep you need to get in that bible and find the word of god that's gonna deal with the situations that you're facing deal with the full onslaught that the enemy is trying to do in your life get in that bible and get that artillery working you don't need to be flashing no 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 laser beam or no bazooka no we firing that we firing that. We getting into the word of God. We opening our mouth and we declaring the word of God so the angelic host can come forth and destroy the works of the enemy in our lives. That's what it is. That's what it's for. That's what prayer is for. That's what prayer is for. Jesus said in Luke 10, 19, he said, Behold, I give you power to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy and nothing shall by any means hurt you. Jesus has given us power. Jesus gave us this amazing power, this super bazooka, this rocket launcher called prayer. And how powerful is this weapon really? Well, I'll give you a quick example. There was a, there's an account in the book of 2 Kings, 2 Kings chapter 19, where King Hezekiah, he received a letter from his enemy, the enemy army that was coming to try and take over his city. The king of Assyria was coming to, the king told him, I'm coming over there and I'm going to kill you and kill all your people. And we're going to take over your city and burn it to the ground. So he sent that letter to Hezekiah. What did Hezekiah do? Hezekiah took the letter. He went up to the temple. He spread it before Jehovah. And he said, Jehovah, see, this is what he's planning to do to us. We need your help. Help us, Jehovah. Only you can help us. You are the God enthroned. It is such a beautiful prayer. 
you must read it it's in second kings chapter 19 the prayer of hezekiah that he prayed when he knew that the enemy was coming for him and these are the kind of prayers we pray pray that prayer lord the enemy is coming for me and pray that prayer that hezekiah prayed pray that prayer and let the armies of the Lord go to work for you. What happened after Hezekiah prayed? After he laid that letter out before, laid that letter out before the Lord. What happened? That night, Jehovah sent one angel, one, one angel, one angel, and it killed. That angel killed a hundred and eighty-five thousand in the army of the Assyrian of the Assyrians. A hundred and eighty-five thousand Assyrian soldiers were slaughtered in one night. In one night. Because what happened? He prayed. Hezekiah prayed. By morning, every soldier was a stiff corpse. And God is so wonderful. He always leaves somebody to testify about his power. The king that sent the letter, he was the only one alive. He was one of the only persons that was left alive. So he was able to testify about the power of Almighty God. Jehovah always has leaves somebody to tell the tale. And it's usually be the one with the biggest mouth. The king sent the warning letter. So he was able to see what Jehovah could do to the enemies of Israel. And why did it happen? Because Hezekiah prayed. That's the power of prayer. The same kind of power is available to us. But we are too lazy too lazy to read the manual we got the bazooka but we too lazy to read the manual to find out how it works we too bit we too busy and too lazy to read the bible to find out the proper use for prayer to find out how people in the bible prayed and what kind of results they got just like the story of Ezekiel. we too busy we too lazy nobody want pray who could pray for 15 minutes 15 minutes is a long time you know who can pray for 30 but 30 minutes is a long time what do you say get in the book and let the book tell you what to say get in the bible and let the bible tell you what to say what we do we play around with the laser light play around with it now i lay me down to sleep gentle jesus meek and mild psalms 23 we, we memorized that from me as a child and my ain't nothing wrong with psalms 23 psalms 23 will give you a breakthrough but if Jehovah only wanted us to study Psalms 23, he would not have put 66 books in the Bible. He wants us to go through the word, go through his word, get acquainted with his word. So what are we doing when we doing these little small little, you know, things just to appease our own self to say we're Christian? We flash in the laser light. The bazooka that could tear up the enemy, that could keep him out of your life. You're not using it for that. You're not using it to keep the enemy out of your life. You're using it to flash the little light to say, Oh, I'm a Christian, I'm a Christian, I'm a Christian. Yeah. And that time the enemy doing you in for free. Like I say, Psalms 23 is powerful, but I'm quite sure Jehovah wants us to get further than Psalms 23. We need to go through that book. Discover all that those words can do all the words that they can do when we put them into our prayer and the next time those little demonic imps show up on your street in your house in your life trying to bully you and trying to depress you snatch out that scripture you've been meditating on and memorizing snatch that out open your mouth and declare that word decree that word all those words of power and authority decree those words and let the angels send them into critical care let the angels of the Lord rip them to shreds. Open your mouth and declare that word that you're meditating on. We have to do better. We, are, we must be tired of letting the enemy beat us up. Anytime you feel like just show up and tear up our lives and go about his business. Because we have no defense. We have our bazooka, we have our heavy artillery, but we only want to flash the laser light. No, get into that book. Get into that book and start using that weapon. Prayer is our most powerful weapon. The enemy comes to steal our joy. He comes to steal our money. He comes to steal our victory. No, no, we're done with that. We're finished with that. Because our Father Jehovah has given us a powerful weapon, a very powerful weapon. 
and we are going to learn how to use it effectively against the enemy. We are ready. Why? Because prayer is our most powerful weapon. God bless you, bless you. It's a pleasure to be with you this evening. Thank you so much for joining me. I pray that something I said resonated with you. You were able to be strengthened and encouraged in your faith and in your walk with the Lord. Let me pray and close. Heavenly Father, I thank you. Thank you for your power. Thank you for the power of prayer. Thank you for the power of your word. Lord, I pray that you would continue to work in us and through us to change this world for your glory and for your kingdom. Lord, I pray that as we continue to study your word, more and more of it would become a part of our everyday life and we would have the artillery we need to fight back against the forces of the enemy. Lord, because we know we cannot hide. We cannot hide from the warfare. It is all around us. We must come engaged, become engaged with you so that you can prepare us and arm us and protect us as we continue to fight the good fight of faith. Your word declares, oh God, that this is a war and the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they are mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. Lord, we thank you for your word that gives us the power and the authority to function and to be victorious in this earth. Bless us now as we go to bed tonight. We pray that you would grant us sweet sleep and we will rise in glory in the morning to know that you are still God and you are faithful to your word. Bless us now, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen, amen, and amen. God bless you, bless you. It's a pleasure to be with you this evening. Thank you so much for joining me. I pray that something I said resonated with you. And as I always say, you could have been doing anything else, but you decided to spend these moments with me. Thank you ever so much. And may Jehovah continually bless your life. Goodbye.